What excuses do you use? Well, Dave, it depends on the situation. <laughs> Whether I look in the rearview mirror and see those red and blue lights going, or, or, or if, uh, you know, the wife is uh, after me about something. It's, right? How many of us have ever used an excuse? How many of us breathe air? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Right. Yeah, we, we, we make these excuses sometimes. Uh, and we're going to look at an excuse this morning in, in John chapter 5. Um, as uh, Jesus asks a man a question. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, apart from you, I could do nothing. And Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you love us more than we could think or imagine. Thank you, Lord, that you pursue us, Holy Spirit, and draw us into your fellowship and into your presence. You have first called each one of us to yourself. Meet us here, Holy Spirit. Sanctify this ground and this in, in this space. Holy Spirit, that we may focus on your truth and upon your word and the message, Holy Spirit, that you have for us. Not words from Dave Schlichter, but Lord, from you. Because your word penetrates to the very soul. And it is only your word that can truly bring change to us. As we desire to be your people, used as your instruments. The Lord, help us to be honest with you today. Hmm. And help us to be honest with ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You ever hear the, the question, what's the maximum effective range of an excuse? I remember... <clears throat> there we go. Well, you can't see that, can you? So, the maximum effective range of an excuse, I remember my drill sergeant when I was a young private, still, still uh, uh, just entering basic training, uh, telling, <laughs> t telling, well fortunately it wasn't me, uh, somebody else, else in our platoon, the maximum effective range of an excuse is nil. <laughs> But there's, there's wonderfulness in honesty and, and owning something and bringing fix to it. You with me? So, what is an excuse? A reason or uh, explanation put forward to defend or justify a fault or offense. Hmm. <coughs> Do we ever outgrow excuses? <coughs> I was looking to some to, to some seniors, at least at least I think maybe seniors. I mean, don't mean any offense, but maybe maybe there was going to be a yeah, yeah. You do no, we we we, we unfortunately don't outgrow excuses. Next question: What were you doing thirty eight years ago? You know, see, I, I, this, this question, uh, it, it applies specifically to you all. Because if I was to ask this at the brig, they, I wasn't born yet, sir. <laughs> uh, I don't know what mom and dad were doing. <laughs> right? But, but what were we doing 38 years ago? Uh, so no, I don't, I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you. But just uh, in case you didn't know, that was uh, 1984. Okay. Um, the Olympics were in, uh, uh, during the summer, uh, Olympics were in Los Angeles, California. Uh, and uh, I had been married um, a year uh, at that time. So these are some statistics. So you may watch Magnum PI or the A team. Anybody remember the A team? Mr. T. And you know, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a minister. Yeah, I, I remember when he got his start. He was a bouncer in a bar. And, and, and remember the old wide world of sports? You, remember, I, well, you all are my people. I like, the, I like, I like coming to y'all. Right? And Howard Cosell. Right? Well, how, wide world of sports had a competition through, uh, with, with bouncers. Right? And it was this obstacle and kind of like the, the modern ninja stuff that they do now. Right? And how these guys, well, Mr. T won the competition and somehow he got on, uh, became part of the A team. Right. Remember show Dallas? 
Uh, that was a that 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 just overran America. People were obsessed with that crazy show. Ghostbusters, uh, the original movie, not the newest one, came out. Was number one and the number one song on the on the top charts. The Ronald Reagan, uh, the 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 Gipper was uh, president. Patrick Swayze started in the movie Red Dawn. Again, we got these remakes. What, what people can't create new ideas? They still just remake the old stuff. And, and, and he's no longer with us. He's, he's passed on. Mary Lou Retton, which is interesting. I put this on there particularly because last year um, I met her and her daughter. My uh, granddaughter does competitive gymnastics, tra uh, traveling competitive gymnastics. And we were at a, a, a gymnastics meet uh, sponsored by she, Miss, Miss Mary Lou, and, and her daughter. But uh, she scored the perfect 10 on the vault in the first in individual round, all-around competition in Los Angeles, and became the first American woman uh, to win an Olympic gold medal. She was 16 years old at that time. When she was 14, she's originally from West Virginia. When she was 14, she was competing, and uh, Bella Corossi, if you remember, uh, the, the, the Russian... Turned American, wonderful gymnastics coach, approached her when she was 14 years old, and he says, I am willing to coach you if you will come and, and live with me. And so her parents you know, worked everything out, and then, then you know, two years later, she's, she's uh, America's sweetheart. But, uh, so 1984, I was uh, two years in the Army at that time. Uh, remember... What's love got to do with it? Some of you are singing the tune in your head right now. What's love got... <clears throat> no, we won't do that one. Uh, oh, the, the Commodore 64, your first computer. Anybody have one of those? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> VCRs. <laughs> VCRs uh, were popular. How many of you still have a VCR? Yeah, good. Because some of those tapes, you know, uh, and what do you do with those 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 crazy tapes? You know, you can't even, you know, yeah, can't can't do anything with them nowadays. But it, you know, part of what's interesting as we look at what was taking place 38 years ago, we look how quickly history changes. You, you with me? How things change. Um, a while back, when I, I, I was preaching at Dave's prison, uh, Pasquotank County uh, Correction Facility, and um, I used a dollar bill. I took a dollar bill out of my pocket and I used it as an illustration, as part of the message, right? Because I'm a visual learner, I like using props and things. And I hold this dollar bill out and I heard this young man uh, over here, and he says, I haven't seen one of those in years. Now we think it's just a dollar bill, but in a cashless society like our prisons are, you know, you even, you know, I haven't seen anybody. And afterwards he came to me, he said, sir, he said, can I touch it? And I said, I said well, yeah, as long as I get it back. And see, and he just, ooh, it's different. <laughs> Again, we just take things for granted. Why? Because we're still in motion with history, right? What happens if your world kind of stops, like our prisoners, right? They, their world kind of stops. You know, the last car they drove may have been 20 years ago. The last time they ordered something from McDonald's may have been 20 years ago. Instead of now, you walk up and there's not even a person there. You just touch this idiot box and this screen and you just wait kind of like George Jetson waiting for the fries to pop out of the bottom or something. And that. Anybody get frustrated with those things? I, I do. I can never seem to get it right the first time. Right? So my point is this. 38 years represents a significant amount of time a significant amount of time. How many of you have been married longer than 38 years? Yeah? My wife and I, we just did 39 years in June. Um, 38 years you've been together. Congratulations. Because a lot of people don't get there. All right, so we're going to turn to the book of John, chapter 5, and we're going to see why 38 years is significant and why excuses are significant. All right, so as you're turning, let's look at a couple of questions towards excuses. I know what's right, but... 
You know, when, you, when it, I don't know that there's ever an excuse that doesn't have a but in it. <laughs> I did it, but... Yes, officer, I realized I was driving over the speed limit, but I'm trying to get to the hospital or whatever. I know I need more time in prayer, but are these anybody's excuses? Will you be honest with me? You know, I promised you all a long time ago that I would never preach a message that I haven't also wrestled with. Okay? And so, um, I'm, I'm like you, with you, I'm, I'm being as transparent as I am with my, my prisoners at work. I'm just being transparent because I, I, I don't have it all together. Right? And if you think your pastor's got it all together, you, one, obviously don't know your pastor. Right? And number two, don't give him enough grace to be human. All right, so we all struggle with some of these things. I know I should spend more time in Scripture to hear God speak to me. But, you know, I heard recently, <clears throat> in talking about prayer, that even many, many people who are preparing for the ministry only spend about six minutes a day in prayer. Six minutes a day, depending on where you go to work, you may spend that much time at traffic lights, which is a good time to pray, too. But, and when Jesus says we can't do anything except through Him, how can we possibly expect to accomplish anything without prayer? And without prayer, now when I'm talking prayer, I'm not talking about prayer with your, with your Christmas list, right? And all your, your, your bodily functions and organs that are going broke, and all your friends' organs that are broken, and, and all of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Part of prayer, and the greatest part of prayer, is intimate fellowship. Just being in the presence of the Lord. Being honest before the Lord. Some of the other excuses. I know I should forgive, but oh, I. Th this is another lesson. So if you ever ask me back, maybe I'll remember to teach on this. But I think unforgiveness is the number one cancer spiritual cancer within the church of America. I can tell you for sure it's the number one reason marriages dissolve. Whether true legally does dissolve uh, in divorce or the relationship dissolves is unforgiveness. Now which is totally crazy because we're a, pre we're a people who gather together. Why? Because of forgiveness. Our sins have been forgiven. Well, I got mine. I'm not going to give forgiveness because but, but you don't know what they did to me. I don't need to know what they did to you. What does Jesus say about it? Right? So everything, every excuse that you can come up with, I want us to look at. I want us to think about what, remember, the, what would Jesus say? What would Jesus say about that excuse? Now, I'm not, I'm not after perfection. I am certainly not a Pharisee. I'm not after uh, a, a religious law. I'm not at, I'm I'm, we're still under grace, praise God. But are we offering Jesus excuses instead of spending time with Him? Instead of Him allowing to be ru true ruler and leader in our life? Are we offering excuses instead of being real. Lastly, I, I know Jesus wants me to, you fill in the blank, but I know Jesus wants me to witness to my neighbor, but I know Jesus wants me to, you know, give financially, but you fill in the blank. Because we all have excuses. 
So, why do we make excuses? We're getting the scripture, I promise you. Why do we make excuses? Just a quick thing. Laziness, I just, don't, I just don't feel like it. I don't have the energy for it. By the way, does anybody work on Cub Cadet tractors? Lawnmowers? Do you? Talk to me after service, please. I've got a demon-possessed one, I think. Um... It wasn't a commercial. It wasn't an endorsement for sure. But, but talk to me, please. Uh, maybe, maybe it's fear. Is it, maybe that's why we make an excuse. I, I wrestled with God for three years uh, when he was calling me to the ministry many years ago. I was wrestled with him for three years and I had all kinds of excuses. But it was all about my insecurity. It had nothing to do with his ability. And finally there came a time when I said, I, I just gave it all. And boy, did my life transform. Maybe I just don't want to. <laughs> want to. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to be obedient to Jesus. Okay. Well, now we're honest. But now let's ask the question. Hmm. Why? What's up with that? That we want to tell our Savior who wants to give us life and freedom. Nah, don't want to. Maybe we're angry. Okay. As a counselor, I deal with people all the time that hold uh, lots of anger. Or, and sometimes they don't even, don't even realize it's anger. Maybe it's from their childhood, but they dealt with it so long they don't even recognize it. Or pain. Some of those things become very real in your life. So instead of ignoring them, let's bring them to Jesus and say, Hey, can you, can you do something with this mess? The truth truth is well, the truth is that we tend to do these things that are important to us so there's no excuse to those things that are really important to you you just do it you don't think about it. you do it right it's see but truly it's what's truly important not the things that we say are important every person in in, in american church today would raise their hand yes i think prayer is important Yes, I think Bible scripture is important. Yes, I think sharing your faith is important. But do you know one half of 1% of the church population have shared their faith in the last year? If it's so important, then why don't we do it? You know I love you, right? Okay. And I'm, I, I think we're kind of feeling kind of heavy right now, and I don't mean to do that. So let's go to, let's go to scripture in John chapter 5. And we're going to see what good excuses are and what Jesus does with them. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holidays. They had many. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the Pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of six pe sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, lay on these porches. One of the men lying there had been sick. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, sick? That was right on key. He missed it. Uh, for 38 years. Now, we already talked about 38 years and what history does with that. 38 years this man has been laying in this, on this porch at this pool, waiting for his life to be changed. 38 years when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time. He asked him, would you like to get well? Now, for some, that may seem like a duh question. But no, no, no. Jesus knew exactly. He pierced into this man's heart. Would you like to get well? Why? Because for 38 years, he'd been trying to get better and doing things his way. And, and you know, the, 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 the issue was that if uh, there was a, a legend that uh, an angel would come and stir the waters and the first one into the water would be healed. I want to see the records of how many people were ever healed. What's my point? People give hope and faith to some things that are dead. This man had been waiting for 38 years. And I wonder how many people he saw healed. If any. You with me? Sometimes we give our efforts and our time and our energies to things that are just dead. But we hope... 
we, we hope. And so this man had been there. Uh, and he gives this excuse to Jesus. Now notice, notice Jesus' question. Would you like to get well? That is a direct question to the man's desire, to the man's will, right? Doesn't have anything to do with his capabilities, does it? Would you like to get well? I want you to hear that question from Jesus today, friends. Would you like to get well? And I'm not talking just spiritually wellness, because you know what? One out of one people die. Um, and, and we spend so much time praying for all these medical and physical healing. I got it. I, your loved ones. Uh, but uh, we're going to leave this world one day. Are you ready for that? One out of one people die. Are your neighbors ready for that? Since my last time I was visiting with you, I had a, a lifelong friend. We were, I was a young en enlisted soldier when he was my squad leader. So if anybody in the army knows what that means, right? And we became friends, lifelong friends. Right? And he, they, they saw me even when I you know, became an officer and chaplain and different things. And we were just lifelong friends. And we would visit their house in, uh, outside of Austin, Texas. And Well, they came to visit me for my birthday in April. And uh, Mark wasn't... Uh, he was on his way to, to Maryland to visit his sister. His mother had passed away back in September, and they were doing some legal issues. You know what I mean? Some, finite, some final things there. And so he stopped at our house there. We're going to spend the weekend with us. And so they came on Friday, and we're laughing and joking. And, and he, he was just really tired from the, from the trip. Um, and he had had some medical issues. And uh, Saturday, he was you know, real quiet, didn't interact with us a whole lot. Sunday morning about uh, 4 o'clock his wife Debbie comes and knocks on my uh, on our bedroom door. She says, Dave I need your help. And I immediately, I'm up and I said, what's up? And she said, we need to get Mark to the hospital now. And so I grab my phone and call 911 for the emergency squad to come, right? And as I'm talking to the dispatcher, I'm seeing Mark, because at the time he's following Debbie with his eyes and then all of a sudden he goes cold. And so I throw the phone down, I assess, we get, now the man's about five foot, five foot four and, and probably 320 pounds. And so anyways, we got him safely into the floor and I started CPR and well, long story short, Mark passed away. Now, so it doesn't matter how much, uh, you know, uh, CPR you do, it doesn't matter what the medical condition is, right? one out of one people die. And my mind went back to a conversation Mark and I had because I was concerned for his eternity. And he gave some of the right knowledge answers. I wasn't real sure about his heart condition, though. But I thank God I'm not the judge. But that became very real to me. You know, and we make all these excuses of why ah, church isn't important, it's full of hiccups, it's just called a bunch of, you know, right, 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 all these people, why? Well, don't blame Jesus because of the, the people who keep saying they belong to him. Excuses. You know, excuses kept, keeps people away from Jesus. What was this question, would you like to be well? What did the man give? He gave an answer about what? His capability. Right? But I, I can't, sir. Uh, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. But that wasn't the question. Jesus asked, that has nothing to do with the question. This is an excuse why you can't get well. And I hear church people every Sunday giving excuses why they won't relinquish this anger or this unforgiveness, or why they won't repent, why they won't ask for forgiveness, why they won't, you fill in the blank. And Jesus is asking us one question, would you like to get well? Now, as old Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. 
Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Now, uh, this, is, this, this, this is incredible to me. For 38 years, this man's been struggling, right? Laying in the same place, this pool, this whatever, you know, and, and his legs did not work. And this stranger comes to him and asks him the strange question, would you like to get well? Uh, well, I'm not hanging out here waiting for, you know, the lottery number to hit. I'm not hanging out here because the food's good. Uh, why? why? And, that, and that, that poses a very good question. Why are you still hanging on to baggage that Jesus doesn't want you to hold on to? Is it comfortable? It's normal? It's an old friend? And Jesus tells him, okay. You notice what else Jesus didn't do? He didn't pay one bit of attention to the guy's answer. Well, sir, sir, I can't. I don't have anybody to help me get in the water. When it, when, well, that's got nothing to do with it. The, the God of creation <laughs> is asking you, do you want to get well? Pick up your, pick up your mat and walk. Now, from the guy's perspective, he may have told him, you know, why don't you stretch out your arms and fly? Because from the guy's mental perspective, it would have been the same impossibility. But there's a very small, very small nuance here that we, we, just, we just blow past and, we, and we, we miss it because we're going 70 miles an hour. Right? It, it, no, notice, what did the guy do? He did it. It's like, no more excuses. Jesus said, Take up your, pick up your mat and walk. And so notice his obedience. His obedience brought that healing. But think about it. It takes about, about three to six weeks for muscles to atrophy. And that's because they haven't been used, right? That's why uh, physical therapy is important, right? When you get in the hospital or whatever. You, right, you keep the muscles moving and using. Three to six weeks before muscles atrophy. This guy has been immobile. His legs have been immobile for 38 years. But in an instant from the voice of God, the neurons were healed. From the brain to the toes. In an instant, the muscles were strengthened, right? From the hips down. In an instant, blood flow was restored. In an instant, strength was renewed by the voice of God and the man's obedience. Now, I don't think he's got up, just popped up and started dancing. I think there was some weebles wobble a little bit going on. But imagine what all taking place. Not only was his legs healed, his mind was healed as well. Why? Because he had waited 38 years and he gave up on the hope of ever being healed, of ever walking again, of ever putting, lacing up those Nikes and running. I heard a story of a, uh, of a young man who, and he was born with no arms and no legs, right? He's a, but he's a surfer. Now he's a, he's a Christian, he's a motivational speaker, goes throughout the world. And, and I thought it was the funniest story. He tells me he, he, he has. <laughs> he doesn't have any feet, but he owns a pair of tennis shoes. <laughs> he has a pair of running shoes in his, in his, in his closet. <laughs> Interesting. Always looking for the future. Always looking forward. Yeah, God would have the capability of saying, be healed. You know, and legs grow and their feet. And I wonder how tall he would be. Right now, he's only about, you know, three and a half feet tall. But he gets, he, he surfs. He does everything he wants to do, pretty much. He's married, married a beautiful young lady. Right? And he goes throughout the world telling people about Jesus. You think your life's tough? Try running a marathon with no legs. Right? It's a matter of perspective, isn't it? So this man, Jesus says, do you want to get well? And see, that's really where the heart, that's really where the heart issue was. The man had given up any hope at all of ever being renewed, ever being useful, ever being whole from his perspective. And Jesus said, pick up your mat and walk. 
And he did. Now we know the rest of the story. The Pharisees got all bent out of shape because it was the Sabbath. And eh, we're not going to go there. We're going to focus on what Jesus did. Jesus says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. We will share a meal together as friends. Now, what does this verse have to do with the story, chap? We were talking about excuses. And Jesus isn't interested in any excuses. He's interested in sharing fellowship with you. And I promise you, sometimes our excuses hold Jesus at a distance. Sometimes our excuses say, I'll let you come this close. And you can have this much of me. But I'm afraid to give you all of me. And Jesus says, I want all of you. I love you that much. And by the way, I know everything there is to know about you. I know you're messed up. I know you've got secrets. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Not but, 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 but. I know. Will you hear Jesus' voice today? I know and I love you. I just want to be with you. What are you carrying that you don't have to? What are you holding on to that Jesus says, I'll take that? It's not doing you any good. That unforgiveness. I, I, I know, I know the betrayal. I know the pain. I'll take that. I can heal that too. If I, I can make a, a lame man who's been broken for 38 years, I can make him get up and walk. I can fix that. Here's what Jesus is really asking. Will you trust me? You know, the devil's number one objective is to convince you that you can live life without God. You don't need him. And keeping Jesus at arm's length is one of those things that he uses. One of those things that we use. Luke 4, 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's speaking from Isaiah. Jesus is reading this in the synagogue. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. That's good news for the, blind, for the, for the blind, good news for the lame man. Hey, get up and walk. <laughs> for he has sent me to proclaim that the captives will be released and the blind will see that the oppressed will be set free. What do you have that's been oppressing you? Maybe suffocating you. Maybe, maybe it's been, been eating away at love in your life. But what about you? The crippled man was told to do something. He did it, and it changed his life. <laughs> the man had no idea the power of obedience. Did you hear that? Did you hear it? The crippled man for 38 years had no idea the power of his obedience to the voice of Jesus. Pick up your mat and walk. Uh, okay. He had no idea how it would change his life. What about you? Do you have any idea releasing that bitterness, releasing that pain, releasing those memories, releasing those... Do you have any idea how Jesus wants to change your life? What are you doing to... Avoid obedience. As you know, you know, certain things like when Jesus says, forgive as you have been forgiven. Love as I have loved you. I mean, you know there's certain things that eh, we're not doing so well. Why? Why do you hesitate when Jesus says, when Jesus says, do you, do you hear the voice that says, oh, that one's not for you. That's for somebody else. Do you hear, oh, no, you can't do that. That's for somebody else. Why do we try? Why, why, why try to do things in our own strength? When he already told us we can't. Apart from you, I can do nothing. Why don't we trust him? Trust Jesus.
Are we afraid? Will we focus more on ourselves instead of honoring Christ? What he wants to do with us and in us and for us and through us? Do you have any idea that, what, how he might want to use you to impact somebody else's life? No, you have no idea. But he wants to. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. Close your eyes. Jesus, we come to you confessing our dependence upon you. Apart from you, we can do nothing. And Lord, it's not about being right and doing right and keeping all of the law because you, you have come to abolish the law. You have set, you fulfill us, fulfilled the law and we live under grace and you love us. In all of our jacked up messes that we are, you love us. And you don't want us to remain crippled by bitterness. You don't want us to remain crippled or blind by unforgiveness. You don't want, to re want us to remain crippled by telling you no. You want us to be free. And those that you have set free are free indeed.